Hi everyone, I'm Les. And I'm Ashley. And you're listening to Anthropotamus, where we explore some of your favorite anthropology topics. Hi everyone, welcome to our latest episode of Anthropotamus. We're here with PhD candidate I.C. Zhang, um, PhD candidate in developmental psychology at UCLA. We'll be discussing uh, her article, Embodying Similarity and Difference, the, the Effect of Listing and contrasting gestures during U.S. political speech. I do not know why that was so hard to get out of my mouth, um, but here we are. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Icy, for coming on the show with us today. Hi, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> Hi. So, um, and I know that's a hard title to pronounce. We <laughs> we struggled a lot when we write that paper with a good title that covers the opinions. So we want to cover, but also are catchy. So we we chose the former. So. You know, I actually just saw a post about using TV shows as titles for papers. And I was like, that is such a great idea. <laughs> like, That's a, that, that is a good idea. Maybe we should have just used the debate titles, whatever was posted on YouTube. Or like a, the articles. Yeah. Or like a funny, like political um, movie title. I don't know. Yeah. Memes, I mean, yeah. 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 That yeah. Would definitely, it would increase traffic. <laughs> I know, right? People search it yeah. out like, oh, hey, what's this? Oh, wow, it's actually, yeah. Actually, That's I think they might, idea. Uh, might. <laughs> Next time. Next yeah, time. Sure. Um, so your research interests helping students understand difficult context, such as statistics, correct? And, in, and then implementing theory based into the classroom. Um, but this article has to do with gestures during political speeches and how they impact the way we uh, process the information within the speech or how we accept it or perceive it. I'm, I'm not sure of the verb to use right now, honestly, um, but please tell our listeners, I mean, how did you just get into psychology to begin with? And then what led you from, I mean, you're studying difficult contact and how people can better understand it into then doing this research on gestures and political speeches. Yeah, that's a great question. And absolutely right. Like when I started, like my aunt, like, all my area of research has been focused on teaching and learning in general. And that still is the case. Um, this is sort of a, actually an interesting diversion of my work that started from my interest in, in body cognition. Um, that's just the idea that people, when you perceive information or process information, it's not just through your, let's say, through looking at things, through listening to things. Also, like your entire physical experience, like including how you move, all the sensory motor engagement, all these things have an impact on your cognition. So researchers, especially in teaching learning, then we leverage the idea, which we call embodied learning, that to design interventions that involve bodily movements. So seeing this since my undergrad, I've always been interested in the idea of how gesture could impact learning. Um, and this is one of the idea when I talk with Dr. Erica Carmel that we started thinking about what about context outside of learning? What about just persuasive speech and the idea that our gesture, which is a highly rehearsing doing persuasive speech, is it really persuading people? Uh, so we turn to the idea of looking at gesture and political speech, which is a highly persuasive context that we try to look at um, are the gestures they use having an impact on human perception. You know, it's interesting but because I just noticed that you're gesturing the whole time that you're actually <laughs> having this speech. So um, I, no, I, I, um, I do a lot of gesturing while I'm speaking just kind of on a natural mm -hmm. basis. And I know it's something, you know, that I noticed while I was reading your article is that um, a lot of people who tend to speak up more often um, that I know of off the top of my head, a lot of people who tend to speak up more often um, without being prompted will gesture a lot while they're speaking just to kind of illustrate uh -huh. their point. So um, there, there's certainly a correlation there as well. Yeah, I mean, even, oh, sorry to jump up, but I feel <laughs> oh, like- No, 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 you're fine. Any... I feel like even in my everyday conversation, like I gesture even when I was a really little kid, but then when I started looking at gesture, I feel like I pay a little bit more attention into how I gesture. Like I practice a little bit more so that I actually, sometimes when I'm too much gesture, I actually try to pay attention to limiting it. And sometimes I try to 
look at my gesture before I talk and things to try to make sure that's the right gesture to do. Uh, just because of the, like, basically the knowledge you can throughout the time that if you gesture in a bad way, that's actually hurting your speech. So all these things are contributing to how I gesture and thinking about how gesture really illustrate your point. So, yeah. The more you know, the more you actually have to think about it. It's <laughs> funny. True. So true. I did have to, uh, I didn't have to, I volunteered. Um, you know, I went to my daughter's school. They were asking for volunteers to speak to the children about um, our occupation. And I realized while I'm standing there, like when I give speeches, I actually don't gesture a lot because it makes me so uncomfortable. So mm -hmm. less you bringing up people who are comfortable talking in public gesture more. Um, whereas I'm just there holding my hands, hoping I don't like say something stupid. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah. when, when I first read the abstract, um, your abstract, the first thing that came into my mind was actually the, the Clinton Trump debate when, Trump was standing like super close to her and like trying to like, like he was trying to mm. intimidate her. Um, but then I keep reading the article and discussing gesture and um, the difference between, you know, when we don't see them and we do see them. And I'm thinking like, mm. oh my God, is this why I don't like talking to people on the phone? Like it makes me really uncomfortable when I can't see people when they're talking uh -huh. to me and I can't see their expressions and their gestures. Like to me, it, it does make a difference and it causes me a lot of anxiety just to get on the phone. Cause I feel like I'm not really seeing what like their tone of voice isn't telling me everything I need to know. That's super. Yep. Go ahead. But you first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I just going to say, that's actually a really good example of what's in body cognition or what people call situated cognition. Um, the idea that when, let's say, just a conversation, a conversation happening over the phone is very different from a conversation that you do over Zoom. And the conversation you do over Zoom is also very different than a conversation you do in real life. It's like how much other contextual factors you have within that space that's like simultaneously impacting the quality of the conversation, but also how you perceive all these information, how you process all these information. So like even there are research showing that just having people encourage them to gesture has an impact on their cognition. So imagine all these things taking away from you, you know, phone conversation. I can imagine that. Like, it, like I, I feel with that. I feel like I hate phone conversation, especially with customer service. So, Oh, God, I yeah. hate customer service. It completely... Uh, <laughs> so I, I was going to say that um, it, as somebody who, uh, who is comfortable speaking in public for the most part, obviously there's, you know exceptions but for the most part i'm comfortable speaking in public um speaking on the phone is an entirely different thing i was actually reading um uh something else that was mentioning mirror neurons and, and all that and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah and it was, it's like well that makes sense if you're able to see somebody and see all their body movements and there there are things that you know that you don't know you know already so when you're missing out on the information you have you're, you're kind of looking at a um, you're perceiving an incomplete picture of the situation which can make you uncomfortable yeah i like this whole argument about like modality like basically the idea that when you're over like for example a conversation happening over the phone that's only one modality you're only getting information through hearing but if you're having a real life conversation you're getting it through multiple senses like and that multi-modality uh, it's basically giving you more pathway to process the information. And that's a really efficient thing argued by the theory, saying that once you've got all these more pathways, there's a decrease in cognitive load and all that. So that was like actually one of the main arguments in why embodied learning or embodied cognition is beneficial for human learning. I'd be interested to see a study that measured the difference between um neurodivergent specifically ADHD individuals and mm. people who yeah, yeah because because of the the um, difference in task switching ability I'd, I, I'd be interested in seeing a study on a, a similar study based on that that would be a really interesting one there is like 
study if am i study on the adhd deficiency like sort of what's different um but i don't think there's something specific for mirror neurons or these things so that is a really interesting topic uh i guess i'll go on to the next question then <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, so you do discuss how politicians gesture during speeches and whether those gestures impact the way an audience perceives their arguments. Uh, for the study, you mentioned the eight types of rhetorical devices, but choose, chose only to use contrast and list. So can you explain to our listeners what rhetorical devices are and why you chose these particular devices? Yeah, of course. So rhetorical devices, um, put in really simple words, they're just tools people use in order to achieve their purpose doing either speech or writing. And because of that, you can see how we see rhetorical devices are really important during persuasive speech because um, they're basically one of the means the speaker used trying to convey their point. Um, and yeah, there are eight types of rhetorical devices. Um, I can try to list them. It's like contrast list, the two we mentioned, and there's puzzle solve, um, headline punch time, uh, combination, position taking, pursuit, and missing, yes. So, but these are like something, some of them are really straightforward. For example, position taking just means that uh, when you are making an argument, you give the sides of the argument, but then you give a really specific point saying that which one, or evaluative speech saying that this is the speaker's position. Um, but all these things, we thought, contrast and list are special and especially contrast is really special because um, the contrast is about a contrast between two ideas. For example, it can be marked through syntax like uh, A not B, the not signifies a contrast. Uh, it could also purely semantic thing, like you can imagine things like up and down, they are natural contrasts. And you can even express this through both the syntax and semantics. So imagine if I say forward, not backward. So that is a marking of both uh, through the semantics forward and backward contrast, but also the not signifies a semantic contrast. Um, and because in contrast, it makes a message more salient through stating the central point twice, like the A not B, it's really saying the same idea, but stating it twice. Um, this is a really interesting place for us to study the idea of embodiment. And other previous research basically has seen that if you are expressing contrast, one in positive, one in negative form, um, people have this natural contrast of idea. For example, for people, um, for them, up and down is inherently spatial. And people have that inherently special idea also in their body. One other really famous study that people have done is that when um, people gesture, they associate the good things with their dominant hand and the bad things with their the other hand. So most often right means good, left means bad, and the opposite for people who are left-handers. Um, so all these natural embodiments are having observed a little bit in contrast, um, but people have not studied how this is perceived by the audience. So the speaker naturally use it, but the audience pick up this use of the gesture when they are doing a speech, when they're hearing a speech. So that makes it really interesting for us to the contrast. And the list is sort of a natural component that we can pick that is a good comparison to contrast. Because in list, that means that you are, basically means you are listing multiple ideas or having more than one ideas that are similar to each other in a speech. So you can see that the list also has the idea repeating more than once, but the ideas is really the similar ideas instead of different ideas. So you can see that basically contrast is emphasizing what we call differences or discontinuity, and then list is highlighting similarity and continuity. And that makes us think, oh, our, if you use these two kind of rhetorical devices in sentences, look at what speakers naturally do, do people perceive the ideas that accompany list more similar than ideas that accompany contrast? So that's a whole motivating question behind the paper. So now I... I I was going to say, now I feel like whenever I speak, I'm going to be paying attention to whether or not I'm using my left or right hand. <laughs> so I have a clarifying question. Um, mm -hmm. So 
you, you said that when people speak, they tend to use their right hand for positive and left hand for negative. Does that seem, or did that seem to have a, a an impact on the viewer's perception or was that just more of the speaker's perception? That study, uh, which was by Daniel Castanano, I think, um, by their group, I don't think they looked at perception. I think that was a study purely on how people gesture, like how, what a speaker does, um, okay. but I'm not entirely sure, so don't quote me on that, but I think they didn't look at it. Okay. Perception. I was just I was just thinking that it might be interesting to um observe or it might be an interesting uh, observation to see whether or not um reversing the the video or reversing the uh, the sides of the video would impact the viewer perception on what the person is saying based on whether they use their left or right hand because obviously you can assume that um they're across from either that your left is their right but if you reverse a video and you flip it mm. um, it might impact the way they perceive it so i can see that impacting viewer opinion depending on who's actually publishing or um uh, televising a speech that's an interesting point and there are like i feel like um so in a really famous book on uh, metaphors we live by they talk about how there are many things that's embodied in nature in metaphors. Like, for example, uh, people's mood, they say, if I'm healing good, they will say I'm feeling up, I'm feeling bad, feeling down. These things are like naturally inherent in space. So the up and down analogy is really salient. Uh, we don't know a lot about left and right. Um, even though you can see some argument in even in politi politics about left and right, what it does that mean? And sometimes people also associate that as a natural embodiment of concepts. So um, I feel like in speech, when, when we talk, like we already know people gesture naturally during speech. And we also know that during these type of political contexts, people's gesture are highly rehearsed. There's a whole team probably behind you on what you should say, what you should, like how you should move your body when you're saying certain sentences. But yeah, I think there is a lack of research in general on how people perceive these bodily actions um, during speech. You know, when you're thinking about, okay, if I say, good and bad and I'm using my right hand first the other person is seeing it opposite right so mm -hmm. to them it's like left right but we read left to right and we say good and bad we don't say bad and good mm -hmm. so maybe it is actually maybe in our mind it's kind of like when we read left to right it's good and bad and we're kind of visualizing it that way well I mean in it English we be. read left to right different languages I mean uh, in our language not yeah 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 I mean, if I'm reading. Well, that's um, another interesting point, though, is like, yeah. yeah. So if it if that is related, then how how does that reflect in languages where they don't read left or right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, there there's a whole cultural perspective on the study of embodiment in general. Although that could have been just something I totally made up in my head right now. <laughs> um, any other questions, Les? Uh, not just yet. Okay. Um. I mean, so now that you've done this research, um, do you feel like that you watch political political speeches differently now? And do you feel like I mean, you you for for your um, for the study, you used what like over a hundred undergraduate students for this. Do you also think that maybe this study also impacted how they may view speeches in the future? Yeah, I mean. First of all, I think it's worth to know that people naturally pay attention to gestures, even when they're not aware of them themselves. So the first point, like sort of following what we just talked about, first of all, people naturally gesture when they're talking, even blind people, they gesture when they're talking. So gesture is something that almost like part of the system when you start speaking. Um, but then I think that's a great question you asked that, like, do you feel like you pay attention to those gestures? And I think that varied in very different settings. Um, in I think after doing the research, I am more aware of the gestures people do. And then I identify specific gestures that is a really familiar gesture through literature and also other research people done. Um, but I do think 
it reminds the question mark of whether my perception changed because of that or my perception has already been influenced like even before my awareness comes in. Because I feel like um, there's a lot of research showing that when people gesture versus a not just verbal instruction, uh, the gesture makes a difference. So that are on population, like when they first see it, it's random assignments, so they, there's no way to cue them, there's gesture that's addition to it, right? So for these participants, they already are perceiving the gesture or influenced by the gesture, even when they're not cued or primed to pay special attention to the gesture. So I feel like um, the awareness increased, but I don't know for the undergrads, um, are they gonna pay more attention? And does that paying more attention mediate the effect of gesture? And that's actually a really interesting question, right? You could um, imagine a study, you actually uh, prompt people saying that you're gonna see gestures in the study, uh, pay special attention to the gestures. Think about how that connect with the speech, how that contribute to uh, your idea, your problem solving, et cetera. And that may have an impact or not, depending on if you think there's a mediation that's going on on how much attention people pay attention uh, pay to the gesture. I think that's a really interesting question that I don't currently have a uh, really firm answer to. But if I have to take a guess, I do think attention is an interesting mediating hypothesis for that. And um, there are other research that look at engagement before, and some has seen it in fact but like gesture increase engagement, not the opposite direction. Uh, but I still think because of that, it's a possible explanation. I mean, in my own public speaking, I've, uh, I, I've definitely noticed that if I'm using evocative gestures, it does grab people's attention more and makes them kind of more engaged, mm -hmm. more likely to um, be able to answer questions later on. So yeah, I could see that being something that would uh, affect their perception of the situation or their their perception of the speech mm -hmm. yeah i i do think there are also other research showing that like this increase in basically how much attention you pay to their speaking gesture and do you see the connection between the two like we've done studies that we look at whether the gesture match or mismatch with your speech and we found that when the gesture match with your speech, it really increases your outcomes. But if it doesn't, it does actually have a slightly negative impact on your outcomes. So uh, definitely that it, it is important that at least people see the connection between your gesture and your speech. Just to bring it back to something I mentioned earlier, um, that seems like another one that would be very interesting to study um, the difference between um, neurotypical and, and ADHD uh, individuals just because uh, I'd like to know whether or not gesturing would be more stimulating and therefore more likely to engage their attention or if it would just be one too many things on on uh, like you were saying we were discussing before their cognitive mm -hmm. load right um, the effects of cognitive load on ADHD versus neurotypical it just seems like an interesting subject to begin with Oh, so <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I think there's definitely work on that already, but building that all on with like work that we have uh embodiment and gesture, these are definitely interesting new domains. Mm -hmm. I do notice um something I really hate when people are speaking is when they keep and I notice this as young as like 15, is when people keep walking back and forth on stage. Oh, and that's they just me. walk back and forth and walk back and forth. And it gets to the point where I'm not even listening to them. Oh. I'm just thinking to myself, please stop walking. <laughs> that, that's me that. every single time. I Why? Can't help, I can't Why? Help you don't it. need to walk so oh. much. <laughs> hey, so I, I actually think of it a lot like a gesture, to be honest, when, when I'm making a specific point, um, taking a few steps and then standing and turning the face, the, the whole motion of your body adds emphasis to a point if you do it right some walking is okay but i'm talking about people that just walk back and forth walk back and forth the entire time they're talking and i'm just like why are you doing that why can't you just stop for like two seconds like what is I, going on i guess there is probably a limit there <laughs> yeah it's always bothered me and always sticks in my head whenever i think about speeches i don't know why it affects me so much um random thought whatever yeah. <laughs> 
so what's next? Are you expanding on this research? Are you starting something totally new? Yeah, so I'm actually like I'm finishing up my PhD this year and then I'm joined the learning science department at UW Madison um, as a assistant professor, which means a lot of my research is going to be naturally focused on learning science, getting into uh, both how theory, advancing theories that we have in the lab, but also thinking about how we can bridge those theories into practical applications in the classroom. So I think some of these work are really informative for the work I do later on because I do still, I really believe in the power of gesture and other sort of embodied pedagogies such as object manipulation, drawing, all these things in swing people's cognition basically. So because of that, I think this is another piece of evidence that showed to us that um, gesture has an impact on people's perception. And because of that, then the next question is sort of how you really leverage that in education. And there has been many research uh, for the past two decades on how really gesture influenced learning. But I think um, all my work, my dissertation work and continue beyond is to think about what's a conceptual framework for that. And really when you move beyond the lab, how do you have a framework that accounts for knowledge development in the context of embodiment? So thinking about when you give students embodiment or embodied pedagogies, at what time point should you give them this pedagogy? Um, what type of pedagogies you should give them, right? There are performing these object manipulations, doing gestures, but simultaneously there are, they can be observing these things. They can just watch someone else do it in an instructional video. Uh, what specific impact that has on their learning and does that depend on their knowledge development? It depends on where they are in their trajectory. So that's the whole focus of my dissertation. And I do expand to um, also develop that further in the next, two or three years. Um, but I think simultaneously, I'm also really interested in other type of learning theories and their impact in education. Like other work of mine, I've looked at things like representations, like how different types of representations are important for students and can we help students better navigate between representations. Imagine, for example, if it's a data science education, mapping between box plots, histograms, scatter plots, all these different types of visuals, and then between R code and other word equations and stuff. So all these things are also definitely things I'm gonna be in my radar, I'm gonna keep an eye for so I think but basically it is really about um bridging like how we have series that we can develop in the lab but then how do they translate into the classroom sorry I saw I saw a lot of you but it's no, it like great I had great. Online. <laughs> don't forget to like and subscribe you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at anthropotamus also please give us a review on Apple podcast and until next time bye Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for listening. Distribution of Anthropotamus is in collaboration with the American Anthropological Association. Please continue to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Anthropotamus for our latest episodes, show notes, and book discussion schedule.